Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Surya Dugarala. I'm an STSM um, with uh, IBM's uh, cloud division. And uh, with me, uh, I have uh, Melorod uh, from um, RBC, Royal Bank of Canada. Uh, today, we're going to talk about um, cloud foundry in action in banking and financial sectors. Um, RBC is at the forefront of um, exploiting cloud foundry in their digital transformation. Um, today, uh, Melorod and I are going to talk about um, uh, how uh, this whole cloud foundry um, journey at Royal Bank of Canada started and uh, what all the applications that they are, um, we are using um, and deploying on cloud foundry. And in fact, Royal Bank of Canada has 40 applications in production right now on cloud foundry, uh, both in uh, retail online banking uh, as well as the commercial banking. Um, so we're going to just talk, uh, if you are, some of you are uh, an account holder of our Royal Bank of Canada, um, if you are looking at your account summary or uh, paying the uh, bill pay or anything, you are in fact using Cloud Foundry uh, right now. Um, in fact, um, we have rolled out to six to seven millions of the retail banking customers. Uh, so it is a very um, highly scalable platform. And, um, you know, how we started this whole journey, actually this RBC's Cloud Foundry journey started in, uh, back in 2015. Uh, so from 2015, um, now as of um, uh, last week, you know, we have around 42 applications also um, in, in production. So, I'll just talk about the, uh, uh, you know, RBC uh, itself. Um, some of you may not be familiar, but this is Royal Bank of Canada is a global uh, bank. Um, RBC is number one um, in Canada, but also it has full global footprint. Um, in, uh, it has around 80,000 um, uh, employees, uh, and also you have uh, um, operations in 42 countries. From RBC's strategic point of view, right, you know, like any other major bank, RBC has multiple lines of business. Um, you can see that you have personal commercial banking, uh, wealth management, um, insurance, investor and treasury services. All of these um, lines of business have um, a multiple um, applications, enterprise applications that uh, we are looking at, you know, getting to the digital transformation and uh, Today, we're going to talk about mainly uh, the, the personal and the commercial banking. So those are the lines of businesses uh, that these 40 applications belong. And we have a technology and operations, TNO strategic um, branch, which will be overseeing the digital transformation across RBC. Um, so um, the main uh, the reason why we are actually talking only about the personal and um, you know, commercial banking right, right now is because that's in the forefront and that's the number one um, leg of this whole LOBs. And then the wealth management and uh, other lines of business are actually following through. So when we talk about um, RBC's business financial services portfolio, um, one of the key pillars of that um, is the commercial banking, and um, I would like to have uh, Melorod um, from RBC talk um, mainly about what is the strategy in the commercial banking and how the business financial services digital portfolio is actually um, adopting the cloud foundry here. So Melorod. Thank you, Surya, and I'm, I'm really sorry for, uh, for missing the first portion of, uh, of our presentation here today. So as Surya pointed out, uh, my name is Milorad Stefanovic. Uh, I have been with RBC for, uh, for some time, and prior to that, actually, I, I lived here in California for, uh, for about a year, so it's always, uh, always good to be back. Uh, so very briefly, um, RBC, as Surya pointed out, uh, is uh, the largest Canadian, uh, Canadian bank. Uh, you may or may not uh, be familiar with RBC in case you, uh, you actually have wealth management products here in the U.S. You may be working with uh, our uh, U.S. Uh, wealth management business. Uh, and we recently have acquired another business here in California as well, uh, City National. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about... Yeah, no problem. What I'm going to talk about uh, uh, here today is our business banking, uh, business banking platform. 
Uh, on the business banking platform, we serve a broad range of clients, from small business clients all the way up to, uh, to the largest uh, business clients in uh, commercial clients in Canada. Uh, the, the group that I'm responsible for, that I manage and lead, is, uh, is focused on digital business banking, so um, online and mobile for our business, uh, business clients. Uh, what's interesting to know about RBC is that, uh, like all other banks, it has been around for a while, and in the case of RBC, the number is 150 years, so around 150 years. Uh, of course, there is a, a long history of uh, technology, legacy technology uh, that, uh, that we have in our, uh, in our stack. Uh, and the group that I, uh, that I manage is no, no exception to that. Um, what, uh, what you're seeing there is uh, our current technology stack in terms of uh, digital business channels, which is the, the group that I mentioned, and uh, online banking. Uh, they all sit on, uh, on, a, on a set of uh, older legacy, legacy systems in, in the back. So what we have done in the in the last year or so is we have had significant uh, push and progress in terms of digitizing uh, everything that we do uh, from, uh, from the full adoption of agile methodology in terms of delivery uh, all the way down to using uh, uh, cloud platform uh, for everything new that, uh, that we are developing. Um, and, uh, and so far the, the journey has been very, uh, very positive. I'll, I'll talk more about that later. In terms of the, uh, the clients that we serve, uh, we serve more than 600,000 uh, small business clients. Uh, we have uh, around 60,000 large commercial clients, and uh, of course, with uh, with commercial clients, we have a large number of uh, of users uh, within those uh, those businesses uh, to, to the tune of around 180,000 uh, users. Uh, in the in business banking, as you know, uh, payments play 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 an important part. And uh, the payments, uh, when we talk about payments, we talk about business to business payments, large corporate payments, which uh, are more than uh, our kind of uh, Starbucks uh, uh, shopping for coffee. We're talking about millions of dollars uh, that, are, uh, uh, that are being moved. So uh, why that's important? Uh, the critical importance of this is uh, that uh, we cannot afford uh, for our systems to be down or uh, for those transaction, transactions not to be completed uh, in a timely and, uh, and um, reliable, resilient, uh, resilient manner, which is something that we have taken into account as well. We, uh, we also provide a number of value-added uh, services to our, uh, to our business clients. And, uh, and that's where innovation comes, uh, comes in. So in addition to innovation that we drive within the organization, uh, it is important for us to, uh, to be able to work uh, uh, closely with, uh, uh, with external partners uh, and to partner up with, uh, with fintech companies as well. And that's, uh, that's another important component uh, of that puzzle that I mentioned earlier in terms of agility, cloud infrastructure, and, uh, uh, and uh, the ability to integrate through APIs. Um, should we go to the next slide? Okay, so um, I think I, I may have uh, actually covered some of these points here. Uh, what is important to, uh, to highlight is uh, that uh, everything new that we have been developing o over the last uh, year or so has been done as, as cloud native, uh, uh, cloud -native uh, micro, micro applications, microservices. And we also are on, in the journey of uh, taking our existing legacy monolithic applications and porting them or moving them to the, to the cloud, uh, cloud platform. Uh, we are doing that uh, both as lift and shift, but in, uh, in cases where it makes sense, we are actually making those applications much more modular uh, and making them closer to the cloud native type of, uh, type of design. Okay, so maybe, uh, sorry, we can cover this part. So, uh, thank you, Manrod. Uh, with that... Okay, you can hear me now. Um, so the main thing when we have segregated all these applications, um, as I said, uh, around 30 to 40 applications, um, they are all under like retail online banking, portfolio risk management, uh, rewards mobile, and you know all these um, different categories. All of these have, uh, we we started with one POC. Um, the the POC is about uh, the online retail banking. So if I were uh, an RBC customer and, um, and trying to check my uh, you know, account summary or uh, trying to pay the bills, right, as I mentioned. So what we were trying, uh, initially we were focusing more on um, the UI and security and the services. Because all these applications are currently deployed in mainframe and using the existing middleware. Um, so we wanted to take one small piece of that and then see whether Cloud Foundry can actually scale 
um, to, to the levels that we expect. And the, the ask was, okay, can we showcase 400 to 500 transactions per second with sub-second response time um, when we run this on Cloud Foundry? Uh, RBC has both um, you know, Bluemix Cloud Foundry local as well as uh, dedicated. The way they are using that is um, uh, they have, uh, for high availability, they have two data centers uh, from a Bluemix Cloud Foundry local point of view. Um, for a, they are both active active and uh, they get the data back from the mainframe. So that's a typical pattern for most of the banking um, and applications. So what we did, we have redesigned the front end um, with AngularJS, and um, we, have, um, you know, we have been using the, the Trust Association Interceptor uh, plugin for security, for authentication. Um, we have actually used that, and we have customized the TAI module, and then we have used for security, and we have used both um, mutual SSL um, you know, authentications there. Right. Um, and also we have these uh, services because the way we access the service uh, from the back end um, is through a data power um, in between and that's the, that's the whole topology. So the simulation of that, um, we started with two Java applications. Uh, one application is um, simulating the orchestration layer, the second one is the stub layer which is simulating the back end interaction from the mainframe. So those are uh, the two main pillars that we have actually deployed in Cloud Foundry. And um, the goal of this whole initial POC was to, to make sure that um, you know, we can scale and also we can use the auto scale features also to, to um, you know, seamlessly scale and uh, you know, expand and shrink. Um, and also we wanted to demonstrate whether Cloud Foundry um, can handle uh, this massive load uh, with stability at this peak load running for like 24 hours, right? So those are uh, initial loss when we started this POC. And um, of course, you know, we have uh, come across initially when we started this whole thing, uh, we were at 12 transactions per second with 90 seconds response time. So we were thinking this, whether Cloud Foundry is ready for the prime time for you know, this kind of banking applications. Um, and then uh, we started uh, working through and we have some of the issues that will be applicable for everybody, right? Um, when you go from an on-premise a middleware solution to Cloud Foundry, um, you have to look into your application, whether some of these things are ready. For instance, you have session affinity if you're using. Uh, the session affinity, if you start using auto scaling, um, then if you few provision, uh, of course, auto scale service, you know, based on the traffic, based on the policy you specify, um, you can have multiple instances provisioned. Um, but if you have session affinity there, um, then the traffic won't be uh, directed to the other instances. So it will stick to the first instance. So those are some of the things that um, you, know, you need to look into when you move your applications to cloud. Um, and then um, other thing that we have um, come across um, was the, um, when you're running your Java or Node applications from within the runtime, um, then what will happen is the autonomic um, threading algorithms that these runtimes will use, um, they may not be working, uh, they may not be agile um, when you are having the backend service uh, latency, that is when you're um, accessing the mainframes. If the service latency is uh, really high, um, then it may not um, really work. So those are um, some of the main things that you know, we have identified and we have um, looked at um, the alternatives to, to fix those things. And that's how we could get from um, you know, like 12 transactions per second to um, not only beat our goal of 400 to like we have gone up to 900 transactions. So just to put some context um, that we are talking about um, um, almost 80 million transactions per day. Um, these are all the financial transactions. They are heavy um, in terms of you have to bring a lot of data uh, from the mainframes, and then you have to render that back onto the GUI with the AngularJS, and also you have a lot of um, computations um, in between. So these are CPU-intensive uh, transactions that we are talking about with 80 million uh, transactions per day. 
Um, so some of the main benefits that we got um, out of this cloud uh, um, journey with RBC are, uh, you know, you can see that um, the return on investment and the client experience that we have, and then with the digital uh, banking channels that um, we, we have actually reduced the risk and cost. For instance, previously it used to take almost a year for us to uh, release a, a, a second version of an app or so. That, from an year to almost, it has come down to like hours. We can actually release the new functionality in terms of whether the front end or uh, any other uh, channels. <coughs> and also the quality and the production resiliency. Um, so I'd like to um, give it to Milorod to, to talk a little bit about uh, you know, what we have gained you know, in this journey um, in terms of the production resiliency and stuff. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Surya. So, as I mentioned earlier, this is really very much part of our uh, digital journey, going from uh, an old school banking institution to a, to a digitally enabled relationship bank. And what you can see here is some of the key uh, key benefits that we have seen so far. Uh, the, the the benefits that we're looking at here are a result of the agile delivery model that uh, that we are following uh, today. And we have within digital business banking, we have ten uh, persistent agile agile teams. They're also a result of the uh, DevOps processes and tools that we have adopted within, uh, within our portfolio and the, uh, the, the, the cloud, uh, cloud platform that, uh, that we're using. Uh, what you're seeing here is the improvement in uh, uh, production resiliency. And I mentioned earlier how critical production resiliency is for, uh, for business banking. We want to make sure that our application is uh, always available for our clients and that there is no, uh, no issues in terms of the, the, the payments that, uh, that we're processing. Uh, we have seen more than 90% improvement in terms of uh, uh, production incidents. So we have reduced the number of production incidents by uh, more than 90% over uh, uh, a short period of time of about uh, just slightly more than a year. Uh, we also, during that time, have seen significant improvement in terms of quality. So uh, 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 we, have, uh, we measure quality, of course, in terms of defect travel rate, and uh, the, the quality has, uh, has improved by uh, more than 40%, uh, in some cases for our maintenance activities, by 90%. Uh, what you can see here as well is uh, the, uh, the the portion of the uh, of the maintenance and uh, and uh, new design and development uh, uh, projects or, or agile teams that we have in our portfolio. Yeah, the, do you want to talk a little bit? Sure. About uh, so, as just to provide a summary, maybe uh, maybe of uh, everything that we have said so far, uh, we had a very positive experience so far. Uh, Developing everything new in our portfolio using uh, using cloud native microservices based uh, based architecture, and uh, we are very very much aggressively pushing in terms of uh, uh, modernizing and uh, and cloud enabling our our legacy applications as well. At this point, we have uh, a portfolio of uh, close to ten micro applications that are used by uh, all of our our business uh, business banking clients. And uh, with our uh, release schedule uh, based on a monthly implementation, so we, we expect that number to, to double in the coming, uh, coming, uh, coming months. So uh, basically, from our RBC's cloud uh, foundry journey uh, using Bluemix, um, is, has been uh, exceptionally positive in terms of, uh, basically, there are two types of applications. One is the lift and shift because um, they have a lot of investment. They did uh, you know, invest in uh, the middleware, uh, like maybe WebSphere or any other message broker. All these applications, um, without any changes to the applications, they want to just deploy them and bring them onto cloud using Cloud Foundry. Uh, they were very successful in that. And of course, we had some migration tools that we had to use um, for uh, you know, verifying that you, know, you have any other capabilities that you had on on-premise that are not there so that you filter out uh, so that it will be easy for. The second type of applications are the pure cloud native and microservices. The one that online banking retail application that I was talking about, uh, which, is which is rolled out to six million um, retail customers, uh, that is a cloud native microservices application. Um, it has been uh, written uh, from ground up, um, and of course, it has used um, some existing uh, security modules and um, you know things. But the application is a, a, a cloud native. So, 
Um, it has been um, a, a mix of both. Um, so the third uh, important point that Cloud Foundry uh, um, usage um, by uh, RBC, Royal Bank of Canada, is um, the operations and uh, monitoring and you know, how you can diagnose any problems that you may have in production as well as um, uh, during the development. So we have another session uh, around uh, 2, 2.30, 2.25 um, that talks about the monitoring uh, and um, diagnostics tools that are available in Cloud Foundry and how RBC is using you know, um, those tools um, to monitor and uh, diagnose any performance issues um, that uh, we have encountered in the production as well as DevOps. So uh, with, with that, um, I can open up for uh, any questions. Sure. Yeah, so, so when you look at your traditional middleware, which you had your middleware services before versus what you're running on Linux, what sort of performances did you see? OK, so the question is, OK, do we see any kind of performance? What is the performance characterization differences between an on-premise same application running an on-premise versus the same application ported and migrating in Cloud Foundry? Um, we saw similar performance, except uh, we found um, if the backend service latency, like when you are talking to the mainframe, and if the backend service latency is actually much higher because of any reason, it may be a network or anything, uh, then you may have to tweak and tune uh, the runtimes because uh, certain algorithms in the Liberty or you know, the, the middleware runtimes, uh, they may not be agile enough if the backend service latency is much higher. Typically, mainframe latency is uh, anywhere from 100 to 200 milliseconds. That's what we expect. Um, we simulated to 1,000. Um, that's when we saw um, really uh, the, the, the autonomic um, algorithm uh, doesn't really uh, adjust the thread pool size for the traffic, so then the performance will come down. But if that is the case, you have two options. Either you adjust that latency, or if you can't do anything in that, then you have to override that autonomic algorithm with a manual. You can specify the manual scheduler and then tune it that way. Okay, so these legacy applications on Cloud Foundry, we are running them on Cloud Foundry, so both. Web Sphere, web Sphere. Yes, WebSphere application. Let's say you have a WebSphere, um, a full traditional WebSphere application, like Java E application, and uh, you are trying to actually run that on Cloud Foundry. Um, in Cloud Foundry, you have Liberty applications. You don't have the full uh, traditional WAS. So you have a, a smaller, uh, smaller footprint Liberty. So as long as your application runs on Liberty, it will run on Cloud Foundry. Sure. What's the distance between your application users, where your front-end runs, uh, and your uh, Google market? Uh, Geo-distance, just understand. They can they're right next to each other, you have Google market. OK, yeah, so the, the question is, OK, where these uh, clients are residing, and where the actual data center, the Cloud Foundry, is running. Uh, the, the data center is in Markham. Um, that's um, like a real um, in RBCs on uh, on premises, and it is exactly the same like where our on premise um, you know servers used to be there, right? So it's exactly the same as far as uh, the data center is concerned for end customers. So, so you're running Lubix locally, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We have uh, both. RBC has both Bluemix local, which is in production, and also RBC has Bluemix dedicated, which they are using for development and testing. So they have both Bluemix dedicated as well as Bluemix local. Uh, for security reasons, uh, you know, they want to keep uh, this on the local. That's the production. You can actually, uh, you know, developers can uh, code their things on and test it on um, uh, the Markham uh, Computer Center, that is MCC and they can actually push it to, for production onto the local. So your performance testing, was it done with, uh, in production or on your dedicated and different Okay, so yes, we did on both local as well as dedicated. Because the architecture of uh, Cloud Form, Bluemix Cloud Foundry is exactly the same, so you will see exactly the same performance on both 
only difference you may see is because um, if you are having uh, multiple tenants, like sharing the env environment, let's say you have uh, dedicated with like so many users that, uh, that are running, then you may see a slight little bit difference in performance. Otherwise, um, you will see exactly the same performance on both local and dedicated. Yeah, so the network latency is the latency between the runtime and the backend services, right? As long as you have, we have a dedicated line between these two. So because you have the dedicated line, the latency uh, effects are taken care of. Yeah, of course, again, uh, the uh, end of the day, you know, if you have your runtime in Dallas and your database is in Toronto, for instance, obviously you will have the network latency. Um, as long as you, know, you have um, you know, like, uh, the dedicated line with maybe you know, 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles, uh, the performance won't be that much impacted on the latency. Uh, sorry? Okay, um, shall we uh, use uh, any certain window or you can do any time push uh, application? We have some controls uh, because this is production, right? So we have, a, um, all developers cannot just push it. So we have, we have to promote and we have a process to promote that and we don't have any window as long as we follow the process anytime you can actually push the, promote the application from uh, development uh, test to production. Maybe one more? Yeah. Uh, in addition to the web sphere, how about your uh, databases and also other uh, AVP? And also how do you handle um, decisions of what versus, versus batch type applications in the new ways? Okay. Um, Online OLAP, um, like um, online processing um, versus the batch kind of applications. Uh, can you use both kinds of applications, deploy them in uh, Bluemix Cloud Foundry? That's your question? Right. Yes, yeah, so the question, if I understand right, that um, this is a common thing if you are trying to access and bring large sets of data, result sets from backend database, um, Bluemix, you can use some caching services to cache so that you can reduce the round trip costs. So Bluemix can handle that caching. Um, you know, you can uh, attach your application to a caching service, um, maybe, you know, Redis or something, right, so that you can reduce uh, the latency of going back to the uh, data service multiple times. That's one thing we can do. And then the second, uh, if you're talking about uh, batching the applications, yes, you can do, let's say you have a Cloudant uh, in the backend uh, as a data service. And if you want to just have some kind of, um, you know, like, you, because Cloudant is like an HTTP based. If you're pushing uh, each time when you go post or get or anything, it's an HTTP call. So you can batch those things together, and then actually you can push at one time. Yes, uh, uh, Bluemix has those uh, features to do that. I, I apologize, I, I'm gonna have to run to pick up a, pick up, make a call, so uh, thank you, thank you very much. Right, thank you.